on July 31, 1952. Maurice Chenwith, a stocky middle-aged man, stood behind the bar of his tavern. Music from the jukebox played with cigarette smoke and the babble of dozens of customers in the background. It was a typical summer night at the Lumberjack Tavern. The screen door swings open. A man enters who went directly to the bar where Chenoweth stood. Without speaking a word, he raised his gun, which was a German 9mm Luger, and he fired six shots at Chenoweth at point-blank range. The bartender slumped to the floor behind the bar. The murderer lowered his gun, turned, and walked calmly out into the night. This is the true story of Lieutenant Coleman A. Peterson and what he did that night to the bartender. These true events were made into a 1959 movie called Anatomy of a Murder, directed by Otto Preminger. The screenplay was written by Wendell Mays, and was based on a 1958 novel of the same name written by Michigan Supreme Court Justice John D. Volker. He wrote this under the pen name Robert Traver. The movie stars Jimmy Stewart, Lee Remick, Ben Gazzara, Eve Arden, George C. Scott, Arthur O'Connell, Catherine Grant, Brooks West, and Orson Bean. Also in the mix is Murray Hamilton. The film was shot in several locations in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Big Bay, Marquette, areas like that. Some of the scenes were filmed in the Thunder Bay Inn in Big Bay. One block from the Lumberjack Tavern, the site of the actual 1952 murder that inspired the novel and the movie. The law library that you see in the courthouse was actually filmed in the Carnegie Public Library in Ishpeming, Michigan. The door that you see that opened into the courthouse, which is in Marquette, was the door to the men's restroom. Otto Preminger originally wanted Lee Remick for the part of Laura because he had been so impressed with her in her debut in A Face in the Crowd with Andy Griffith from 1957. And he knew that she could play this young, sultry woman, even though she was eight months pregnant when Preminger approached her for the role. A few weeks later, he called to tell her that he had given the part to Lana Turner and instead offered her the smaller role of Mary Pallant. But Remick boldly refused this offer. Later on, on an especially hectic day, she received a call saying, that she did indeed have the part of Laura because Lana Turner turned it down. She thought that it was a joke and she hung up. It took another phone call to convince her that she was being offered the part. With Lana Turner being first offered the role, when she agreed to do it, she did it with the condition that she would wear gowns that were designed exclusively by her designer. When director Otto Preminger objected that such gowns were not suitable for the role, Turner turned the part down immediately. The studio was ready to give in to Turner's demands, but Preminger resisted and gave the role to Remick instead. The bartender's name at the place where Parnell is drinking at the very beginning is Tovio, and the guard's name at the county jail is Sulio. Both of these names are Finnish. The movie being set in Michigan has a large Finnish population. After lots of people emigrated there from the Nordic countries into the U.S. and Canada in the late 19th century all the way up until the mid-20th century, Finnish names usually don't have any specific meaning. But Tovio means hope and Sulio means means sweet, charming, and adorable. When Paul Beagler, played by Jimmy Stewart, attempts to telephone Laura Mannion, he has to dial a zero and get the operator to connect him. This film was made when many small towns had one exchange with three-digit telephone numbers, 
and calls from outside the exchange required an operator to complete them. It's kind of interesting that the fact that Jimmy Stewart's middle name is Maitland and the judge who was replaced by Judge Weaver was Judge Maitland. This is all completely coincidental. Judge Maitland was mentioned in the original book by John Volker, which preceded the movie and its casting. Also, when Jimmy Stewart's character goes into the hotel to visit Catherine Grant, the clerk at the desk is reading Leon Uris' book, Exodus. One year later, the director of this film, Otto Preminger, would go on to direct its film version in 1960. Lee Remick apologizes to Jimmy Stewart's character for going to a roadhouse when she realizes that it could hurt her husband's case. Her husband is played by Ben Gazzara, who would go on to play the main bad guy in the movie Roadhouse 30 years later. His character is supposed to be 28 years old at the time of his arrest, and that's the same age as Ben Gazzara was when the film was released in July of 1959. George C. Scott's character, who is absolutely amazing. You've just got to see this movie to believe how good some of the acting is in it. And George C. Scott blows you away with his portrayal of Claude Dancer. During the trial, he mentions that he learned a French word for panties while he was serving overseas in the war. While Scott served in the Marine Corps during the Second World War, he spent his entire stint in Washington, D.C. Most of the principal male cast, though, served in the wars, including James Stewart, Arthur O'Connell, and Joseph Welch. Oddly enough, Ben Gazzara, who plays U.S. Army Lieutenant Frederick Mannion, didn't serve in the military at all. The movie premiered in the U.K. at Columbia Theatre in London at its full 161-minute length in October of 1959. Columbia's UK division then asked Preminger to cut the film by 20 minutes, which he did on the understanding that the cut version would only be shown in small-town market cinemas, but not in London. Columbia then supplied the cut version to its regular UK outlet for its general release, including the London market. Preminger was furious, because not only had they done something different than they were instructed to do, they also inserted an intermission, which the director didn't authorize. He also got into it with Columbia Pictures later on, when he sued them and its subsidiary, Screen Gems, when it sold this film in a package of 60 movies to the television market for $10 million. In the market of New York, ABC interrupted the 160-minute film 13 times with 36 commercials. Preminger came unglued that his film was completely being mutilated like this, and he took him to court in a highly publicized case. But he lost. Now, this movie was just filled with controversy at the time. Rarely did you see words that this film uses on the big screen. It just didn't happen. Some of these were so shocking and people were so offended by it that Jimmy Stewart's own father hated the film. He called it a dirty picture. And he actually took out an ad in a local newspaper telling people not to go see it. Now think about that. That's the lead in the movie's father doing this. Most people had never seen language like this used. None of this stuff was bad at all. It was just words that people weren't used to. And seeing it related to this sultry lady on the screen made the censors go crazy. A big part of the controversy around the words that were used consistently, terms like bitch, contraceptive. The word panties is used all the time, and that had never been heard before. The word penetration, slut, and the word sperm. 
None of these are used out of context or in a bad way because it's all descriptive terms that are related to the trial. But it sure upset the masses and especially the censors. You think back on when this was done and it is pretty amazing when you watch it and you kind of understand why people looked at it as a dirty film. These are terms that would have come up in a normal trial during testimony. Lee Remick does play a pretty sultry lady. You combine that with these words that have never been said before on screen, and you got a recipe to send the censors through the roof. I feel that this movie is one of the best movies that's ever been made. If you've never seen it, do yourself a favor and spend the two hours and 45 minutes watching it. You will be so glad you saw it. It's truly in my top 10 films of all time. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll continue to chase the classics.